I'm sure you know by now what the message is tonight. By the grace of God, we want to talk to the queens tonight that are sitting over here on this side of the room. You are very special. Now, I don't understand it, but I know that it's so. And you may think I'm getting hard on you before we're done tonight, but I just want to let you know ahead of time you're very special. Not to me, but to God. And I don't understand all that, but I just know this. Every time this subject comes up, something unusual goes on inside of my heart. And I believe it's because you're very special in the sight of God. And I believe that you're one of the greatest hopes for the men that are sitting in this room tonight. They're sitting right over here. You're one of the greatest hopes. So I desire this evening that you not feel like you're just a woman and you have no ministry. And there's nothing special for you to do. You're very important to God. He has a work for you to do that only eternity will show the fruit and result of it. Yes, the poem is true. Most of you will not stand in a place where you'll receive a lot of attention, a lot of praise, and a lot of honor. But eternity will show. Eternity will show. I'm very excited about the potential of this message this evening. I want to speak on the hidden woman. There's a lot of power in this room. There's a lot of influence in this room sitting over here on this side right over here. And I just pray and cry and long before God today that he would give all of you sisters a vision. You younger sisters that are not married. You younger sisters that maybe it's years before you get married. I cry and pray that God will put a vision in your heart and put a burden on your heart for the truth of the message that is given this evening. We could title the message, The Power of a Submissive Spirit. I think of some of you younger girls that are in here this evening. Oh, that you would learn the power of a submissive spirit. You'll never have any power with God until you learn what a submissive spirit is all about. So whether you're 10 years old or 5 years old or 12 or 15 or 20 or 50, you need to learn what a submissive spirit is all about because that's where all the power is for you. We could say, we could title the message, How to Make Your Husband a Man of God. And I just begin by saying this as a reminder to us. God's ways and man's ways are very different. And the message I'm giving tonight is another one of those paradoxes that do not make any sense in the natural mind. But if we look at it in the Word of God and we obey what the Bible says, we'll get the results that God says in His Word. We're talking about a hidden woman this evening. If we could turn to Proverbs and just read a couple of the verses that were already quoted. Proverbs chapter 31. Proverbs chapter 31, we'll just read verse 10 through 12. But I'm grateful that the children quoted the whole chapter there. Proverbs 31 and verse 10 begins, Who can find a virtuous woman? And it's given as a question. And I would say it's becoming a cry in America that's getting louder and louder and louder. Who can find a virtuous woman? Where are they? In light of what we've read here in, in uh, Proverbs or what was quoted to us already this evening. We've heard the words. We heard it again. We've had our minds refreshed as to what a virtuous woman is. And yes, we can cry out against America tonight and say, who can find a virtuous woman? Where are they? Where do you find them? Where do you find those women who will stay at home? Where do you find those women who will guide their homes? Where do you find those women who will submit to their husbands? Where do you find those women who are anointed by the Spirit of God? Where do you find those women who will be a hidden woman and support their husband and hide in the shadow? and support him and pray for him and be a blessing to him and honor him all the days of their life. Where do you find women like that today? And I know that your heart's cry is to be all of that. And I just remind you, I'm not just preaching to you this evening, but who knows who will listen to a tape like this and the cry is coming out to America. Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. 
If you have found one of these women, you have something more valuable than a whole handful of rubies tonight. You've got something more valuable than a big pot full of gold tonight. If you've got one of those kind of women who will support you, brethren, and pray for you, and stand behind you, and encourage you, and lift you up, and guide your home, and raise your children, and take care of your clothes, and cook your meals, and clean your house. You've got something worth more than a big pot full of gold tonight. Who can find a virtuous woman? Ah, the heart of her husband does safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. Oh, what a blessing that is. She'll do him good and not evil all the days of her life. He can count on her. He can trust her. He knows what her responses will be in the thick and in the thin of life. He knows what her response will be. His heart safely trusts in her. He knows how she'll handle the money. He knows how she'll guide the home. He knows what she'll do when he's away. His heart safely trusts in her. She's valuable. She's a jewel. She's a handful of jewels tonight. A virtuous woman. And I think I'll discipline myself to look over here because my heart rises up when I look into the face of some of you young men and say, Young men, don't you settle for anything less than a godly young lady that you know that'll live that way in your home. Don't do it. Many have settled for less because of some pretty little girl that had a fancy little dress on and they paid for it the rest of their life. Don't do it, young men. Don't do it. Find a virtuous woman. What we have here and we read these verses is we have a picture of a woman whose life is wrapped up in being a helpmeet to her husband. His heart safely trusts in her. He doesn't have any worry. He has confidence in her. She does him good. She lives for him. She wants to please him. She wants to support him. Her life is wrapped up in him. My sisters, this evening, God did not make you to raise your children. He did not make you for that. Although that's one of the duties that most of you will have in your lifetime is raising children. But God did not make you to raise children. God made you for your husband. That's why you're here. God made you for your husband. If God had not seen the need for man to have a help meet, there'd be nobody on this side of the room tonight. Amen. God did not make you to raise children. He made you for your husband. Many a mother finds her fulfillment in her children. Many a mother does that. Finds her fulfillment, her beauty, her joy, her blessing in her children. But it's not God's will. Your fulfillment is supposed to be in doing what you can do to bless the life of this man that God gave you. And that's where you'll find the fullness of joy, the fullness of a beautiful life, the fullness of blessing, the fullness of fulfillment. That's where you'll find it, nowhere else, if you're married. If you're not married, you'll find it in doing all of that for your heavenly husband. Praise the Lord. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 2 and just read there a little bit. Pray for me tonight, very weary. Genesis chapter 2, and we'll read verse 18 through 23. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone, I will make him and help me for him. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found and help me for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. There he named her. All the other animals got a name. And when it came time to look to see if Adam had a mate, he had no mate. And God brought him a mate and then Adam named her. That's where you got your name, sisters. You're called woman. 
because Adam named you. But in these scriptures, as we read, we can just picture these verses. Here's God watching his creature, watching Adam, whom he'd made, and speaking within his heart and saying, it's not good for man to be alone. I will make him and help me for him. And it seems like the scene switches there and all the animals are being brought before Adam and Adam is watching them come by male, female, male, female, male, female. And Adam gives them names and he calls the male lion a lion and the female lion a lioness. And he calls the cow, he calls the bull and the cow and he gives them all their names. And all these animals are going by Adam and it says there was not found an helpmate for him. And Adam knew that. He was no dummy. He was a very intelligent being that God had made. And he knew that. He could put two and two together and realize male, female, male, female, male, female, male, no female. And then God put him to sleep. And while Adam was asleep, God took out of his side a rib. And out of that rib, out of Adam's side, and out of that rib, God made a woman. And when Adam woke up, God took the woman and brought the woman to Adam. Can you imagine how he must have felt? Woman! Male, female, male, female, male, female! Oh, he must have been delighted that day. Oh, his heart must have been thrilled. He must have been filled with joy that day when all of a sudden he woke up and found that God had given him a help me. You ever stop and think how Eve must have felt? I mean, she was not. And then all of a sudden, she was. She found herself existing. Why am I here? You've been made for this man right here. If you were not made for this man, Eve, you wouldn't be here. Can you imagine how that must have settled down over her heart? Do you think she had any problem getting in her place before the fall there? Did you think she had any problem getting in her place? I am here because of Adam. And if God did not see fit that Adam have a wife, I wouldn't even be here. What do you want me to do now, Adam? Where would you like me to go? What can I do for you? Here's the true spirit of marriage, isn't it? If we could take the two of those and just both of us, us brethren on one side and the sisters on the other and just meditate on the spirit of that revelation in the scriptures there. That is the true spirit of marriage right there. The man, God has given me a gift. The woman, God has made me for this man and I'm a gift for this man to be his help me. Oh, that's a blessing. The full revelation of the reality of that was upon Eve and that revelation as it sinks down in the hearts of each one of you sisters can change your life if it hasn't already. Absolutely transform your life and your home. Well, I'd like to make a statement at this time. I'm sure you've heard this before. Behind every great man, there's a great woman. That's a fitting statement to say after we've looked here in Genesis at a great man and a great woman that God gave to the man. Behind every great man, there is a great woman. How many of you ever heard that statement before? But it's of a worldly origin. That little statement, let me tell you what it really means. Out in the world, behind every great man, there was a great woman behind him, behind the scenes, pushing him, challenging him, telling him to go, pushing him to do it, making him great, motivating him, driving him so that he'll rise up and become a great man. That is the worldly interpretation. That is what the world gives here. Behind every great man is a great woman. Pushing, driving, motivating that man to become something. And the connotation the world gives is, if he didn't have that great woman there, he'd never be a great man. She's the one who made him. Well, that's not right according to the Bible. Now it is true, behind every great man there is usually a great woman. But what does that mean? What is a great woman that's behind this great man? If I could say it this way, behind every great man there is a hidden woman. And thus the title of the message, a hidden woman. One who has found her role and her place and her power before God and her husband. According to this book, behind every great man, yes, there's probably a godly woman. Praying, supporting, 
loving, admiring that man. We need that, us men, we need it. And if I could just say this, you unmarried girls, you young ladies that are here tonight, I would just plead with you just to open your heart tonight. You're kind of in a free state. You know, this message doesn't have to be at all heavy on you. You're free. You're not married. You haven't failed yet in a home. You're just a young lady, maybe someday to be married. I would just encourage you to open your heart up and ask God to just fill it full of the spirit of this message all evening. Make it the longing desire of your heart to become, yea, to develop the characteristics of a virtuous woman, the characteristics of a hidden woman. Because a virtuous woman in most ways is a hidden woman. She doesn't get a lot of attention, but oh, someday in eternity, she'll get plenty of attention. When I think of a hidden woman, I think of the illustration of J. Frank Norris. He was an old Baptist preacher that lived back in the 1930s during the Prohibition days. J. Frank Norris, back in the early days of his ministry, was a dud. He was a flop. He was a powerless preacher. When he preached, nothing happened. Never won any souls, never had any lives changed. He was just a preacher. I'm not sure why he even got into the profession of preaching, but he was a preacher. He was a flop. And he was ready to get out. He was ready to get out of the ministry. He evaluated his life. He said, I'm not effective. I'm not having an influence on anybody. God is not using me. No souls are getting saved. I'm ready to get out of the ministry. That's how he was feeling. But he had a wife who was a hidden woman. She didn't tell him he was a dud. She didn't sit him down and tell him what a flop he was. She didn't remind him on Sunday afternoon that no souls got saved when you preach today. She didn't do that. She was a hidden woman. She was a wise woman. And God laid it upon her heart to pray and fast for her husband for three days. He did not know it. He did not know that God had laid that on her heart. She was a hidden woman. She didn't go to him and say, by the way, I'm going to pray and fast for you for three days that God will take care of you and deal with you and, and straighten your life out. She didn't do that. She was a hidden woman. She just simply heard from heaven and planned in her heart a time when she could set aside and pray and fast for that husband of hers that she knew wasn't doing very well in his spiritual life. Well, on J. Frank Norris's side, he was ready to quit. He had some meetings in a certain town in Texas, and he decided, well, I'll go to these meetings, and I'll speak this, this week of meetings out, and when these meetings are over, I'm done, I'm quitting, I'm getting out. He didn't tell that to his wife either. So off he went to the meetings. And during that week, it happened to be the very week that the God of heaven laid upon the heart of his wife to pray, earnestly pray, pray day and night, pray without ceasing, pray with a fervent heart, pray with a pure heart, pray with a burdened heart for that husband of yours. He went to the meetings and preached night after night after night and it came to the last night of the meetings. He was walking down the street heading for the church house and he was saying in his heart, well, this is the last night and I'm done. This is the last night and I'm done with the ministry. I'm not effective. I've been here all week and nothing's happened here. I'm just, I'm just going to quit. And he walked into that church house and he got up behind that pulpit and something happened to him. God began to move upon his heart in a mighty way. A mighty way. God's spirit began to prevail upon him and he began to preach and he preached in a way that he'd never preached before. And when he got done preaching, it was time to give the invitation and he gave the invitation. And the hardest sinner in the community was sitting in the back row and he stood up and walked down the aisle and fell down here at the altar and started to cry. And then a young rebellious son stood up and he made his way down to the front and he began to weep and mom saw him go and she got up there next to him and dad came up and knelt next to him on this side and, and they got right with each other and somebody else stood up and they came down to the front and the people just started coming one after another and after another and after another they came. J. Frank Norris dealt with people until midnight that night and he called his wife after the meeting was over with and he could hardly contain himself to tell her what had happened. 
And he kept trying to tell her and couldn't tell her and he'd break down and cry and, and get back on the phone and try to tell her again, break down and cry. And finally he told her, oh honey, God poured his blessing out tonight and we got revival going on around here and, and I'm a changed man and there's hope for me. And he shared how he was ready to quit and all those things and she was on the other end of the phone and she just said, I know honey. God gave me a burden and I prayed for you and I prayed through and I knew God was going to bless you this week. Oh, I'll tell you, that, that may not be good theology to some of you, but there needs to be some sisters that learn how to pray through. You know what that means? It means you pray and you pray and you pray until you get a witness from God that he's heard your prayers and he's going to come through and give your answer. I mean, you need to learn how to pray like that. Well, she was a hidden woman. He went back from that meeting with a new courage in his heart and a blessing on his ministry and began to preach and souls began to get saved in his church and the church grew there in Fort Worth, Texas and he got a call to start a church in Detroit, Michigan and, and he pastored two churches at the same time. He'd be in one church for one week and another church the next week and flew back and forth week by week. He'd go like that, preaching the gospel and building the church and building the work of God for the kingdom of God. All because he had a, a hidden woman. Oh, may God raise up some hidden women like that. We need it, sisters. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 33. I want to show you how you can make a man of God out of your husband. Providing he's not just a rebel. But yet, according to 1 Peter chapter 3, there's even hope for him if he's a rebel. If you'll listen to what I'm saying tonight. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 33. And this verse is kind of a summation of all the verses that preceded it concerning husbands and wives. We'll just read the last verse. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. I want to show you how you can make a man of God out of your husband. How you can help him to be the man of God that he should be. How you can help him to be the father in the home that he needs to be. How you can help him to be the leader in the home that he needs to be. How he can become a man of influence and have a ministry and be able to have an effect upon people's lives. How he can be one who's known in the gates. J. Frank Norris was known in the gates and he had a wife who was a virtuous woman. So I want to show you how you can help your husband this evening. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 33, we see this one little word we want to look at. That's the word reverence. There's a lot of words hidden in that word reverence. Let me read them to you. And the wife see that she reverence her husband. That is, submit to him. That is, notice him. Regard him. Regard what he says. Honor him. Prefer him. Venerate him. Or give him much worth. Esteem him. Defer to him, praise him, love him, admire him exceedingly. And let the wife see that she reverence her husband. Reverence her husband, submit to him, notice him, regard him, listen to what he says, be concerned about what he has to say, honor him, prefer him, count him of much worth, esteem him. Defer to him, praise him, love him, admire him exceedingly. You want your husband to become all that he needs to become? Reverence him. You know, last night, sisters, some decisions were made here. And of course, I knew what I was going to say tonight. But the decision got made over on this side last night. But there's a need for some mighty, powerful activity going on on this side in order for those decisions that were made by the men last night to be carried out. You saw them. You saw them walk up here. You saw them kneel down. You knelt beside them. You heard their prayers. You heard the cries of their heart. Now, trust them and believe in them and submit to them and notice them. And regard them highly and honor them and prefer them and esteem them and praise them and love them and admire them exceedingly. They need all of that. They're going to carry out the commitments they made last night. They need it, all of it. Let me look at it on the other side here just a moment. 
Let me tell you how you can make your husband a mealy-mouthed man. One who sits in the corner, doesn't talk very much, won't lead out in conversation, he's afraid to make decisions, and always looks to you to see what you think before he speaks. Let me tell you how you can make your husband a mealy-mouthed man. One who kind of just sits there, doesn't talk much. You know what I'm talking about? He's just kind of afraid to move, make decisions, He's kind of a wallflower, he lets you lead out. Let me show you how you can make your husband that way. Some of you young sisters, just set yourselves to not notice him. Disregard what he says. When he comes home from work at night, don't go to the door or anything. Just go about your own business. Act like he didn't come home. Disregard what he says when he's talking. Look the other way. Bring up some other subject. Dishonor him and belittle him in private and in public. Get on the telephone and tell somebody else what he's like. Disobey him. Don't put much value in him or what he has to say. Push him to get your way. Find fault with him. Despise him. You do that for about five years, and I guarantee you, you'll have a husband like what we just read here. And I know, or I trust that I know, that nobody wants that kind of a husband. Well, I've seen men who had tremendous potential turned into mice by those kind of activities. And I've also seen men who had very little potential made into valuable men by women who were hidden women who honored and blessed and encouraged and admired and supported and prayed for their husband. We're talking about a place of power tonight where you can stand that will bless your husband. We're talking about the power of submission. We're talking about the power and the influence of reverence. We're talking about having a powerful influence on your husband and in your homes tonight. That powerful place to stand is underneath his authority. And if I could just give you this reminder, get the spirit of the message tonight. Don't worry about all the details. Get the spirit of the message. If you get the spirit of the message, you can write a new list of how-tos. You can write your own book in 10 years. Get the spirit of the message. If you'll grasp the spirit of the message, if you'll get a vision of what God can do through you in your place, in your home, you can write a book in 10 years. Don't be loaded down tonight. Just let your heart say, God, that's what I want. That's what I want to be. Help me to be that kind of woman. In Ephesians again in chapter 5, let's read verse 22. Wise, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. We want to look at that verse here this evening. Illustrate it a little bit. I don't know, maybe when you walked in here, you saw this chair sitting up here and you knew what the chair was all about. But we're just going to use this chair as an illustration this evening. Just about every home has a chair that the husband sits in. I have one that I sit in. In fact, I have two that I sit in in my house. And everybody in the house knows that I sit in them. I don't know if you could say it's Papa's chair, but everybody knows that's the chair that I sit in. If I've been away for a few hours, I'll walk in the house and sit down in my chair where I always sit and just visit with the family. So we're going to make this chair up here tonight the chair that sits in your house where your husband sits when he walks home, when he comes home in the evening. He's been away for a while and he sits down in this chair that's in your house. Only for the purpose of illustration tonight, we're going to take your husband out of the chair. We're going to put the Lord in it. Now your husband's not in the chair, but the Lord's in the chair. You're just going to go to your house. And the door opens up. And the Lord himself walks in. Instead of your husband one evening. And he walks over and he sits down in that chair where your husband usually sits. What an exciting thing. The Lord walked into my house today. And he's sitting in the chair where my husband usually sits. How are we going to respond? I mean, the Lord's sitting in your house. Isn't that a blessing? How do we respond? Well, you'll probably ask him if there's anything you can get him. Lord, is there anything I can get you tonight? Well, yes. Yes, there is. I'd like a cup of tea. What kind of tea would you like? A cup of mint tea. Yes, Lord. And oh, you go back into your kitchen. Glory. The Lord's in my house. 
The Lord sitting in the chair. The Lord wants a cup of tea. You're going to make that cup of tea. Oh, you'll be so excited to make that cup of tea. You'll get the best water you can find. You'll get the best tea you can get. You'll get the best honey out of the shelf you can get a hold of. And you'll make that cup of tea for the Lord. And all the while, while you're making it, you know what you'd be thinking. The Lord's in my house. The Lord wants a cup of tea. And I get to make him one. And you take that cup of tea out there. And here you go, Lord. And give him that cup of tea. And you're not going to walk away from that chair. No, not like you usually do with your husband. Here. No way. I mean, the Lord's sitting in that chair. You're going to give him that cup of tea. And you're going to stand there to see how it is. He's going to take a little sip. I is it all right, Lord? I said, it's a little hot. Oh, I'll get an ice cube. Quick, and run into the kitchen and back you go and drop an ice cube in it. Is it sweet enough? Yes, it's fine. Oh, the Lord's in my house. And supper's on the table. You aren't expecting the Lord. You're expecting your husband. It's five o'clock and your husband usually comes home. But the Lord came home tonight. And it's five o'clock and all the food's on the table. And all of a sudden the Lord says, oh, by the way, I got a few phone calls I need to make. Could you uh, hold the supper a little while until I get done with my phone calls? Oh, sure, Lord. I'd be glad to do that. I'll just pick it all back up and put it back in the pan. And I'll put it in the oven and I'll keep it warm. You take your time and make your phone calls. Right? I wonder if we'd even think. Doesn't he know I made this meal? Doesn't he know how much I work for it? Doesn't he know it's already on the table? I don't even think you'd think those thoughts. I mean, he's the Lord. We do whatever the Lord wants. Right? Well, that's what it means. That's what Ephesians 5.22 means. Wives, submit yourselves unto your husbands as unto the Lord. And I was reading it in another translation and it says as a service to the Lord and I thought that's beautiful there's the Lord sitting in that chair there's the Lord sitting in that house you wives submit yourselves to your husbands and serve your husbands as a service unto the Lord as if you were serving the Lord and I think to myself you know even while I say this I don't deserve that kind of treatment and none of us do None of us deserve that kind of treatment. I know that. But let me ask you sisters a question. It's true, we don't deserve it. But do you think it'll make us a better man or a worse man? That kind of treatment. Do you think it'll encourage us or discourage us? Do you think it'll make us feel good about ourselves or not good about ourselves? Do you think we'll be hard on you or kind to you if you treat us that way? I'll tell you what it'll do. A husband who gets that kind of treatment will sit in that chair and say, I don't deserve this. I do not deserve it. I am not worthy of this kind of treatment. What can I do for my wife? How can I show her how grateful I am for the way that she serves me so lovingly, so sweetly, so submissively? That's what he'll do. Unless he's a rebel, and just a selfish man. You know what he'll do? It'll make your husband hit the altar. You know what usually happens when I preach this sermon? If I give an invitation, an open one, a bunch of the men will hit the altar. They'll hit the altar and say, God, we don't deserve it. We're not worthy of it. We're not in the shape we need to be. God, help us. Give us the grace to be the men we're supposed to be. That's what it does to the men. Just to hear it. I'm sharing a secret with you tonight. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. This is a secret, sisters. There's discontented women all over this country that do not know this secret. They don't know it. They have no idea of it. When they look at the role of a woman, they see that thing as a miserable life that they don't want to have anything to do with. When they look at their husband, they see somebody that they are setting out to change any way they can by nagging, by complaining by uh, bickering at him. That's the way they see it. But I'm telling you tonight, I'm sharing a secret with you. How you can help your husband to become a man of God. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. Let's read through verse 6. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. Well, let's just stop right there and notice what it says. It says, likewise, ye wives. Likewise, in the same manner, ye wives, in the same manner? In what manner? Well, the verses that are ahead of that are talking about Christ. 
who also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner, in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. Now, I believe that we can say that God has told us in these verses right here, how you can have the most influence upon your husband. Right here. The word subjection there means adapt yourself. Women, adapt yourselves and adapt your lives and adapt your thoughts and your desires to your husband. Eve, you were made for Adam. Adapt your life to his. He was here first. I put him in charge. I gave him instruction. He knows what to do. He knows how to carry it out. You be his help me and adapt yourself to his life. I put him in charge of the garden. You find out how to do it. You are a helper of a husband who's put in charge of the garden, Eve. Adapt your life to his. In verse 2, that word fear, the last word in verse 2, it again is the word reverence. While they, a lost husband, beholds your chaste conversation coupled with reverential fear. Reverential fear to him. For him, honor him, bless him, support him, pray for him, adapt to him, love him, esteem him, admire him. And he will behold your reverence and be one without the word. How can he be one without the word? Because you become the living word in the home. That's how he's one without the word. You become the living, anointed, breathing, effectual living word of God in the home. And that's how he gets one. He beholds your chaste conversation. Even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, it says in verse 4, and there is no sense of a dominant woman in that. The ornament of a meek and a quiet spirit. Sisters, you will never change your husbands by trying to change your husbands. You will never do it. How many of you know who Charles Spurgeon is? Let me see your hands. Charles Spurgeon. I think he was a Baptist preacher in England. Charles Spurgeon, he lived about 120, 130, 40 years ago. He was a preacher. He was a good preacher. He was a man of God. He had a very unusual wife. I'd like to tell you a little bit about his wife tonight, sisters. Just to be an encouragement to you and to give you a vision of what God wants to do through you. Spurgeon had a wife. She was a blessed wife to him. She had some unusual characteristics that I'm not encouraging you to do, but she knew Greek and Hebrew. I guess she could read it just like you read English. She was unusual that way. She made a good expository preacher's wife. She knew Greek and Hebrew. But she was a helpmate to her husband. When Spurgeon wanted to preach a sermon, he would get a text from God. In his study, then he'd call on his wife in the evening hours, Saturday evening, and she'd come in there on Saturday evening, and he'd sit back in his easy chair, like this chair up here. He had a chair that he sat in, and he'd sit back in his easy chair, and Spurgeon's wife would go to the shelves and pull every book down that had any kind of a commentary on that verse that Spurgeon had gotten from the Lord that he was supposed to preach on. And the Lord just sat there back in his easy chair and she read to him for several hours out of all those commentaries. Everything that those commentaries had to say about the text that he was going to preach on the next day. And then when she got done, she went out of the room and then he got before the Lord 
and made his outline, and the next morning he got up and preached with power. She was an unusual woman. She had a name that she called him that I'd like to share with you sisters. She called him Tershatha. When she'd uh, greet him in the morning, she would say, Good morning, Tershatha. And it was kind of a special name between the two of them. She knew Greek and Hebrew, and he did too. And Tershatha is a Greek word. It means, my reverence, good morning, Tershatha. How are you this morning? Good morning, my reverence. How are you this morning? Oh, can we get a glimpse of the spirit of those words tonight? Can we get a glimpse of the spirit of those words? See, they're not just words. There's a spirit behind those words. There's a spirit of honor. There's a spirit of love. There's a spirit of respect and reverence in those words. Good morning, my reverence. Sarah called Abraham, Lord. Good morning, Lord. And that word Lord means master. Good morning, my master. Good morning, my Lord. Good morning, my leader. Good morning, my guide, my authority, my husband, my blessing. Good morning, my reverence. Good morning, Tershatha. Now it really doesn't matter to me this evening what name you have that you call your husband. The spirit behind the words is what we're after tonight. The spirit behind the words. We're talking about reverencing our husbands. And I realize I'm speaking to all kinds of different sisters here tonight. You're in all kinds of different places with your husbands. Maybe you don't even have a sweet word you call your husband. Maybe the, the gap is that far between you that there isn't even a sweet word or, a, or there isn't even a honey there or a deer. Maybe it's that way. But I'm telling you by the authority of the word of God that the spirit of reverence needs to come out of your heart and mouth to your husband. What was she saying when she said, good morning, Tershatha? She was saying, Charles, I love you. Charles, I highly esteem you. Charles, I care about what you say. Charles, I'm glad to be under your authority. I like it under your authority. I like it so much, I'll call you a name that speaks of authority. Charles, I like being under your authority. That's what she was saying. Good morning. Tershatha, I'm glad to be under your authority. I belong to you, Charles. I'm here for you, and my life's desire is to just live for you. That's what she was saying. What do you think that did to Charles? Brethren, what do you think it did to Charles? Every man ought to be a king in his house. We can't all be kings, but every man ought to be a king in his house. Every man ought to know what it feels like to be a king. He ought not to ever walk around like a king. He ought to be a servant, but he ought to know what it feels like to be a king and sit in a chair and be honored and blessed and reverenced. Every man ought to know how that is. Every one of your husbands ought to know what that's like. It is the will of God that you reverence your husbands. And there's a blessing tucked away in there, sisters, a great blessing. And nobody will find that blessing until they move in to the area of reverencing their husband. But there's a blessing in there, I'll warn you. It's a sweet one. Think with me a little bit this evening about the illustration of a fish out of water. That's what I think of when I think about the women of the world today who are career women, who are bold, who are aggressive, who talk too much, go too much, they want to make a name for themselves and all that. I think of a fish out of water. You ever watch a fish out of water? It's very interesting. You take that fish out of the water and it starts doing some funny things. First of all, its gills will start going in and out and in and out real fast because it's, it's trying to get oxygen, but God didn't make it to get oxygen out of the air. God made the fish to get oxygen out of the water. And that fish, you take it out of the water, it starts gasping for oxygen but can't get any. You take that fish out of the water, it'll start flip-flopping just like this because it needs oxygen and it can't get any. And if you hold it out long enough, it'll slow down. And if you leave it out long enough, it'll die. But if you take that fish out of the water, just think of the illustration. 
hold it out for a while and watch it gasp for oxygen and watch it flip and flop and flip and flop and gasp for oxygen. That's a mighty uncomfortable fish. Discontent, yeah, it's discontent all right. But you take that same fish and just drop it back in the water. Oh, what a beautiful picture. It'll just swim away like that. Oh, it'll just swim away through that water and it'll be free and it'll enjoy itself and it'll be right where God made it to live. And I think of these poor ladies, these feminists, these women's livers, these career ladies. They remind me of fish out of water. That's what they remind me of. Sometimes I deal with them in the business world and they're in the business world more and more all the time. I didn't read the book, but my wife read the book. Let's see, the book is called um, The Way Home by Mary Pride. That book is a very interesting book. It was written by a woman who was a career woman, who was a career woman. And she shares in the book what was really going on inside of her while she was being this career woman. You know what she was? She was gasping for air. She was hurting on the inside. She was unfulfilled. She was empty. She was not happy, even though she was seeking to be a career woman and, and all those things. She was miserable on the inside. And when she finally got back home, it so fulfilled her life that she was motivated by the Lord to write a book so that all the other career women could read it and find out they're in the wrong place. To send them back home. Well, God made you for your husband. He made you to reverence your husband and bless him and encourage him and be a helpmeet to him. I wonder, are you a fish out of water tonight? If you're trying to make that man do it, you're a fish out of water tonight. If you're trying to do it instead of him doing it, you're a fish out of water tonight. Your environment is your God-given environment of support and encouragement and service and reverence. And in that place, Life will spring forth for you and you'll swim right through life with the greatest of ease and freedom and blessing. The feminist movement is not a new movement. It's been around since the fall. The Bible has a different word for it called rebellion. I'd like to share another illustration with you tonight about a young lady that I knew many years ago. Her name is Jane. When I was in Bible school, I had responsibilities there in the bus ministry had a lot of students who worked for me, under me. And among those students, there was one young lady that stood out to me. She stood out to me back then. She stands out to me more now than she did back then. She was a single girl going to school. I think she was studying to be a school teacher. Her name was Jane. She was a godly young lady. She had been guided with some godly principles as she was growing up. She knew the principles of a hidden woman, although she probably never heard a sermon like this. She knew the principles of a hidden woman. That young lady, she was a blessing to me. As I served there in the Bible school and in the bus ministry, it just seemed like she always knew what to say at the right time. She knew when to write a little note. She knew when to pray. It just seemed like she knew how to be an encouragement and be a blessing to me. And, and I wasn't her husband. I was already married then. I was just a leader and she was just one follower among many there in the school. That's all she was. Somehow or another, she had the sensitivity in her heart to know how to encourage a man to become all that he's supposed to be. And at just the right time, I'd get a little note from her. When I was struggling in my own life, dear brother Denny, God bless you today. I prayed for you two hours today. God be with you, Jane. She'd write that little note. Just the right time, when the weight and the burdens of the work were heavy, I'd get a little note from Jane. Dear brother Denny, God bless you today. I know you're carrying a heavy load, but God's grace is sufficient. I'm praying for you. I'd get another note like that right on time. And I always admired this young lady and I always thought, boy, some young man is going to get a jewel with this girl. Well, one day she came to me to seek some counsel and she said, Brother Denny, there's a young man who would like to date me. And there at the Bible school, that meant more than just a date. It did mean somewhat, you know, that he's considering me for marriage. And she said, Brother Denny, I'd like to know what you think about him. I don't want to just date some fella. I want to know what you think about him. Would you please check him out? 
So I told her, sure, I'll do that. And I would encourage all you young sisters to do that. When some young man would like to see you, write to you, you go to some men in authority and you ask them, what do you think? So I went and I checked this young man out and I didn't know him real well, but I asked around a little bit and uh, found out who he was and found out what his character was and all of that. And he was a fine young man. He seemed like a nice young man, but he was, you know, he was just kind of a mediocre young fellow in the school. I, I thought to myself, well, come on, Jane, you could have anybody you want in the school. You're, you're a jewel. You're, a, you're a, a great young lady. You're a, a young woman of God. You could have any young man you want in the school. Are you sure? This is the right one. He's just kind of, he's just kind of okay. But I went back to her and I told her, well, he seems to be a nice young man and I, I don't think there's any problem with it. Go ahead. So they started to date and I guess in about a year it was, they got married. And that young lady, she knew the principles of being a hidden woman. She went after that young man and blessed him. She poured all her strength into his life. All those notes that I used to get, I didn't get them anymore. He got them. All those prayers... He got them. All those words of encouragement, he got them. That submissive spirit that sat there looking at me when I was preaching, he got them. He got it all. He got a jewel, by the way. She poured all her strength and all her power and all her prayer power and all her spirituality. She poured it all into that man, loving him and encouraging him and supporting him and praying for him and lifting him up. Two years later, he was a new man, a man of God, a man of direction, a man of purpose, known in the school, known in the gates, sisters, known in the gates. He was known in the gates. Young man of God, a fine preacher, a leader, a man of direction, a man of purpose, one you can follow. That's what he was two years later. She knew the principles of a hidden woman and she knew that there's as much power available to her as there is to any man who stands in the pulpit to preach. She knew. Another illustration for you this evening. John Rice. John R. Rice, he's gone. He's in heaven. He was a man of God. He was an evangelist. He was an editor. He was an author of 50 books, I believe. He was known all over the country to be a family man. But John R. Rice was a busy man. He had a wife, Mrs. Rice who was a hidden woman. She was a hidden woman. And John R. Rice was an evangelist. And he traveled and traveled and traveled. He was gone weeks and weeks and then come home for one week and be gone weeks and weeks again and come home for one week and be gone weeks and weeks again. Most of his life he was gone. There's no way that he could practice consistently what we've been preaching here this week. He was gone all the time. Now, I believe that he did while he was home. Because he was known everywhere to be a family man. He raised six lovely young ladies for daughters. He had no sons. Might not have worked out quite the same if he had sons. But he didn't have time. He was busy. He was too busy to be the kind of father that he needed to be. But his six daughters never felt neglected. Mrs. Rice honored him. When he'd leave for a preaching trip, she'd gather all the girls around in a circle and they'd get on their knees in the living room and they'd pray. And all the girls would hear Mama pray, Oh God, bless Daddy. We thank you, Father, that Daddy is out winning souls. We thank you, Father, that Daddy loves you. We thank you, Father, that Daddy is in the work of God and he's caring about your work and he's out there in your vineyard. And she would pray like that and those girls would also pray. Or daddy. They never knew. They never knew that he neglected them. They never knew it. And they turned out to be fine young Christian ladies. In fact, now they're older ladies and they even have grandchildren. But all six of them turned out to be fine young ladies. Why? Was it Dr. Rice? No. It was Mrs. Rice who was a hidden woman and just got in there and filled up the gaps and lifted up that husband and blessed him and honored him. That's what she did. The Lord let her live to be 94 years old. I think I'm right on that. She just died about half a year ago. She spoke all over the country 
all the way up till she was 94 years old. Where do you think she spoke? She spoke to women all over the country till she was 94 years old. You know what she told them? Love your husbands, honor your husbands, build them up, submit to them, be their support, be their blessing, be their encourager. That's what she did. And I believe the God of heaven said, I'm going to keep this old lady alive as long as I can. And she had the strength at 94 to speak to women. I don't mean this many. We might have a hundred ladies here tonight, but hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them at one time. She was an older woman teaching the younger women to love their husbands and reverence them and honor them. Let me ask you this question. Is honor based on perfection? Are we supposed to honor because somebody is honorable? Is that the Bible teaching? Or is honor based on position? Which one? If you're driving down the road, and all of a sudden you look in your rear view mirror, and you see these little red and blue lights going around behind you, and you pull your car over to the side of the road, the policeman gets out of his car and walks up to the side of your car, what are you going to do? You're going to honor him. He might be a drunk. You might even know he's a drunk. But when that man walks up to your door and says, would you please give me your driver's license? You'll get that driver's license out and you won't just give it to him. You'll say, yes, sir. And he'll sense honor and respect coming out of your spirit, won't he? Amen, he will. Honor is not based on perfection. It's based on position. The policeman gets his due honor because of his position. He might be a drug pusher. Some of them policemen, they go out and raid a bunch of drugs and turn around and sell them and make their money themselves. That's not very honorable. But we honor them because of their position sake. If the governor knocked on the door of your house, you may not even know who he is. If the president knocked on the door of your house and you opened up the door and saw him standing there, the governor or the president, what would you do? You would give him honor. Why, he'd probably get the same treatment that the Lord got over here in the chair a little while ago. If a governor came to your house, if the president knocked on your door, honor, he would sense it. It would be all over you. You would be clothed in honor as you spoke to him, wouldn't you? Honor is not based on perfection. It is based on position. Sisters, we've got to get a hold of that. That is the truth. We see it with the policemen. We see it with government officials, but for some reason or other, it is gone in our homes many times. We don't feel like we have to honor in our homes, and our homes are hurting for it. They're hurting tremendously for it. Honor is based on position. And children, you can learn something about this too. Your father and mother are supposed to be honored, not because they're perfect, but because God said to do it. They are your authorities, and you need to honor them, respect them, and reverence them. We know that. We understand it. Sisters, we teach it to our children, don't we? We tell them with our mouths, honor thy father and thy mother. Let us teach them by our example to honor father. Let us teach them by our example. Honor is based on position, not perfection. Sisters, not a one of us, brethren, are perfect. Not a one of us is always worthy of honor. Not a one of us. But God says, honor, reverence, respect. The devil is chipping away at the strongest unit, our homes. If you feel free to talk about your husband when he leaves, if you feel free to complain to the children about daddy when he's not around, whoa, 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 whoa. That is big stuff. You should never feel free to do that. There ought to be a line inside your conscience that says, no way. Let me share another story with you. And this illustration comes out of Lancaster County. But I don't know the names and I'm glad that I don't. There was a nagging woman who lived in Lancaster County. She dishonored her husband. She picked at him. She fussed at him. She nagged him. She told him, you're dumb. She told him, you can't do anything right. She told him, you won't take responsibility. You're a good for nothing. That's the way she treated her husband. That woman had little girls in the house. They were just little girls. 
And you know how it is when your children are small, you, you just don't really think much. You know, you're not quite as careful what you say when they're small and all that. Well, she was that way with them. And those little girls, they just watched. You know, they loved their mama. And they, I mean, they were, they were thinking in their heart, I want to be just like mama when I grow up. That's what they were thinking. And those little girls, they watched that mama tear that husband apart with her words day after day after day. Then one day those little girls grew up and became teenagers. And they felt the freedom to sit their father down and tell him. And oh, it hurt him when he saw the, the same thing that he was getting from his wife coming out of his daughters. And they would sit him down and say, you're no good. You don't love me. You can't do anything right. What do you know? You don't understand. That's the way it was when they were teenagers. Well, those teenagers, they got a little bit older and they got of marrying age and and they, those girls, they found their husbands. And they sat their husbands down and told their husbands how wrong they were, how dumb they were. Well, how come you didn't fix that thing yet? That's the way they talked to their husbands. And they had a couple of little girls at their feet. And their little girls were just standing there very innocently watching Mama and thinking what all little girls think. Oh, when I grow up, I'm going to be just like Mama. And they were watching Mama while Mama was tearing that husband apart and telling him how dumb he was and why don't you fix this and can't you ever do anything right. And, and those little girls became teenage girls. And that husband who married that woman and had all the right expectations and dreams about how his home was going to be found himself sitting there in his home and his teenage girls were tearing him apart and saying, you're no good, you don't love me, you don't understand, who do you think you are? One day those teenage girls grew up and it was time for them to get husbands. And the same thing happened there also. Let me ask you this question. Who's going to stop that chain? See, we could go on here all night, couldn't we? We could just do it again and again and again. It just gets passed on from one generation to the next generation to the next generation to the next generation. Who's going to stop that chain and break it? Our little girls are watching our mamas tonight and they're saying, I'm going to be just like mama and they're going to be just like mama. They are going to be just like mama. And someday they're going to grow up and someday they're going to get married and they're going to be just like mama. You know what would be right to do when it's time for them to get married? Tell that young man, by the way, I mean, you mothers, if you're going to keep going the way you're going, you need to sit that young man down and say, by the way, I ripped my husband apart all my life and my daughters learned it from me and you can expect it if you're going to marry this girl. That's what you need to tell them. Somebody needs to break the chain. The chain must be broken. It can be broken. It can be broken, sisters. Let me ask you this question. If your husband were lost tonight, would your holy conversation win him or drive him away? Which would it be? Are you the stronger of the two? You know, this day and age we live in, it's that way a lot. I see it everywhere. Are you the stronger of the two? Do you have more insight? Are you the more spiritual? Are you the one that prays more? Do you have more spiritual thoughts? Are you more aggressive? Are you the one that speaks out easier? Are you the stronger of the two? My sister, God did not give you all those things to go ahead of your husband. He did not give them to you for that. Those things are there that you may get in your place and get under that husband and pour all your spiritual energies into him. And not with the motivation that you're going to change him. If you've got the motivation tonight that you're going to change your husband, if you think, oh boy, I've got it now and I'm going for it, it'll never work for you. No, it is your place. It is your position. It is God's will. It is your environment. It's the water that God put you in to be a wife and to be a mother and to be a loving wife and honor him and bless him and support him. Not so that you can change him just because it's God's will. That's God's will for you. I think many times it's pride that pushes a woman ahead of her husband. It's pride. You know what the women of today would have done if they were J. Frank Norris's wife? You know what they would have done? They would have took over the church. They would have been the pastor. That's what they do. That's what they do now. You see it all the time in the advertisements. Pastor and Mrs. So-and-so come as they minister to you in their church. Yuck. 
That's so wrong. It's so far out. I'll tell you, every time I see a picture like that, you know what I know is going on? There's a weak man and a strong woman in that picture. Every time I see that, every time I see a couple in the ministry like that together, you have a weak man and a strong woman, and she leads out. That is not the will of God. God's Spirit is not moving women to just pass their husbands up and leave them behind. He is not doing that. He is motivating you to get in your place and be what you're supposed to be for your husband. Sisters, let him fail. Let him fail. Let him flop. Let him fall on his face. Let him be a total ruin. Let him ruin the finances. Let him ruin the home. Let him fail. Then when he fails, he'll rise up and get a hold of God. Don't run out ahead of your husband. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 9 in closing. Here's what you do, sisters. What shall we do, brother Denny? Shall we rise up and take the lead? Shall we pick and peck at him? Shall we call someone up and cry to them about our situation? Shall we just give up and say there's no hope? No. Here's what you do. Jeremiah chapter 9. I would encourage you, sisters, to go home and just read the whole context of Jeremiah chapter 9. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider ye, and call for the mourning women, that they may come, and send for the cunning women, that they may come, and let them make haste, and take up a wailing for us, that our eyes may run down with tears, and our eyelids gush out with waters. For a voice of wailing is heard out of Zion. How are we spoiled? How we are greatly confounded? Because we have forsaken the land, because our dwellings have cast us out. Yet hear the word of the Lord, O ye women. Hear the word of the Lord. And let your ears receive the word of his mouth. And teach your daughters wailing and every one her neighbor lamentation. For death is come up into our windows and is entered into our palaces. To cut off the children from without and the young men from the streets. Oh, there's what you do, my sisters. There's what you do. That's what we need you to do. You know, it's very interesting while I was studying this chapter that even Jeremiah said in the first verse, Oh, that my head were waters and mine eyes a fountain of tears, that I may weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Even Jeremiah felt like he had a need that wasn't being met. And God spoke to Jeremiah and said, Thus saith the Lord. This is what you do. Call for the mourning women. Call for the wise-hearted women. And gather them together. And let them take up a wailing for us. For us men. Sisters, take up a wailing for us. We know that we're wrong. We know that we failed. We know that we're weak. We know that we've made a lot of mistakes. We know that we've grown up in a generation where there was no leaders. And most of us are not the leaders we ought to be. We acknowledge it. We readily acknowledge it. Take up a wailing for us. Go to prayer. Go get a hold of God. And by the way, mothers, don't complain to your daughters. Teach them how to wail. Teach them how to cry and pray and sigh before God that God would do the work that needs to be done in the men that are over on this side of the room. That's God's will. That's what you need to do. That's what a hidden woman does, my sister. She prays. Oh, it's so interesting to me every time I study revival. You know what you end up finding? Back there in the hidden shadows, in the boiler room, in the basement of a church house, or in some little shack where a couple old ladies live, you'll find some women praying. Every time you study revival, it seems like you find some women praying down in the boiler room somewhere. And I believe that's one of the reasons why it seems like there's a special burden on this kind of a message every time because God is moving upon women. To get a hold of him for their husbands, for us, for the men, that we'd be all that we need to be. Let's kneel for prayer together. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus tonight. I pray for the sisters, Lord. I pray that you'll bless them. Oh, God, we need them. How we need them, Lord. They're very special, Lord. Your spirit it moves upon their hearts in unusual ways. God, I just pray for each one of them tonight. I pray, God, you'll give them a vision. I pray, O oh, Father, that you'll give them guidance. Guide them in the right way, O oh, God. Give them hope. Give them faith in their hearts, O oh, God. 
Lord, I pray that you'll help them to go God's way in this whole thing. Lord, so many women are trying to change their husbands. They complain, they nag. And I know, Lord, they grow weary. I know that, Father, we are not the leaders that we need to be so many times. But, oh God, I pray that you'll give them fresh courage tonight to believe your word, to believe that God's word will do what God says it will do. Oh, Father, I just commit each one of them into your hands tonight. I pray a special blessing upon them. Oh, Father, I pray you'll give them help, give them courage, give them strength. We need them. We need their help, Father. We need it desperately. God, I pray that you will help us all to work together to put this thing back together, Lord. It's not right. It is out of proportion. Many men are weak, Lord. Many men are not leaders. Many men do sit back. Oh God, I pray that you'll help us to work together to make it happen again. Bring us right back into biblical perspective, Lord. God, we ask it tonight in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for listening to this message. We trust that it has been a blessing to you. If you would like additional sermons or a catalog, Please visit our website at effortofministries.org. Call us toll free at 855 557 7902 or write to us at Ephrata Ministries, 400 West Main Street, Suite 1, Ephrata, Pennsylvania, 17522. You are welcome to copy this message for free distribution. This ministry is supported by your donations. May the Lord Jesus bless you.